Here, my, my first question is, uh, how long did it take you guys to do the, to do the interview in, in the first place, or to do the, the whole documentary? So, you know, the, the initial conversation with my father took place in 2006, and then, um, you know, we do interviews uh, when we had time and money to travel. Myself and my director of photography, Dan Akiba, um, we would, you know, we went to uh, Arizona, Vermont, Florida, Pennsylvania, and New yeah. York. Uh -huh. um, yeah, and, and conducted these interviews. Of, uh, you know, so putting them together, I probably didn't get to a real rough cut until 2012 or 13, and then it took you know a bit more time after that to get it to a point where I could actually shop it around to festivals and stuff like that. So that was about 2015. So it was a slow process, but it was you know grueling work for 10 years or anything like that. It was kind of picking up at it. Did you know what you were getting into whenever you you started the project? No, no, I mean not at all. I mean the, the real. Um, the real point of, of the initial conversation was an oral history. I mean, it was sort of, um, I had it in my head to, to do a, a, a talk with my father about um, about his, you know, his time in the army, mm -hmm. uh, just as just as a, you know, an act of preservation. Essentially, um, a big part of it was that my father had had gotten in touch with the parents of um, of one of the the guys, Lori Bailey. Um, you know, who was killed in 1970. So mm, right. my dad, 30 years after Loring's death, actually you know, began a friendship um, with uh, Loring and Dorothy Bailey, who were the parents of this guy. Um, and that, that friendship lasted, um, you know, until their, they passed away in 2009 and 10, I think. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a, you know, that, that was a big part of it, was my father's connection to the, to the parents of, of, a, of a soldier that he who was killed there. Did you, do you have like a history with documentaries? Um, I, well, no, actually, I mean, now I do, but I, you know, before the, um, before the initial conversation with my dad, it was mostly that, uh, this guy I mentioned, again, Dan Akiba, um, was my director of photography, he was going to, uh, City College in New York, um, for a, uh, an MFA in cinematography, and he, he was pretty into documentaries at the time, and so he and I, I, I was roommates with him when I first moved to New York, and we had worked in Boston on film sets and, and commercial sets before that, so we've been friends since about 98, um, and, and in that time, we, we sort of um, f felt ourselves, to, you know, certainly Dan first, um, we felt ourselves sort of um, moving away from the interest in their cinema and, and, and sort of kindling this interest in, um, in documentary, and so once he went to City College, uh, I got kind of, um, you know, at, at living with him at the time in 2002 in New York, um, I got to, you know, Anytime he brought a film home to watch, or you know, a stack of movies from the library to watch, I would watch them with him, or I'd borrow them and watch them by myself. So it was, you know, filmmakers like, you know, Herzog and Daryl Morris and Alan Berliner and uh, Ross McElwee, um, you know, a lot of first-person Nick Broomfield, a lot of first-person documentaries, um, stuff that had to do with family and identity, um, and and those things that I realized were really, really interesting to me. Um, and, and keep in mind, this is sort of right after the 2000 election and the 2003 invasion of Iraq, uh, and, and, you know, 2001, the September 11th. So there was a lot yeah. going on politically that kind of drove me to uh, politics, civics, and nonfiction. Was there anything in particular? Like, was it specifically one one war? For, for me, it was always Vietnam. I mean, you know, you know I, I've heard somebody, and I can't, of course, I'm not going to remember who said it, but I've heard, I read a quote somewhere, I heard a quote somewhere that, um, we're always most uh, human beings are always most um, fascinated by the, the the generation that they missed that they that preceded them. So um, my you know growing up um, and, and being sort of in love with you know music that came out in the 50s and 60s and uh, you know certainly um, the, the 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 political climate of, of the 1960s and, and early 1970s that that war and the, and the public's reaction to it um, the, the the movies about it the music that was that was created during that time as a result of it, as a, as a reaction to it. Um, it's just influenced by the, the, the divisions in society, in society and like, in the culture. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things that, that's endlessly fascinating. Um, not that not that other you know, periods in history aren't, aren't fascinating, but I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the fact that my dad grew up in it. Was, so your, your mom had mentioned something. that uh, your dad was an introvert, but the one thing that he would talk about is Vietnam. So... In, in that sense, were you brought up just hearing a lot of his stories, and were you already comfortable no. with his timeline? No, no, we didn't ever talk about it. I mean, he, he, um, he, he is 
he is an introvert, but that, that being said, he, he wasn't at all, um, you know, emotionally unavailable or, or cold or anything like that. He, he didn't, we, we didn't talk about it, but it wasn't off limits uh, as a topic of conversation. It just wasn't really something you, you, you talked about. It was like a, you know, it was like eternal illness or something. It, it just was there under the surface. It wasn't something that we always brought up. But even if we did, he would answer questions about it. Um, I can't tell you how many people, I mean, you know, the vet, well, there's one person in the film, John Wilson, who served with, uh, with Rick Bailey um, in 1970 and, and was there yards away from him when he was killed. Um, he said that nobody's ever, you know, he told me nobody's ever asked this question. I've never had this conversation before. Uh, you, you were talking about what your dad thinks, but as a narrator, you, you seem like you're very fascinated with your dad's, your dad's story, but we never really hear your views on, on what you think about war. And you're very elaborate and, and descriptive with your your descriptions and um, your words. So it just seems like something that we never really heard as an audience. What do you What are your views on on war itself, and and is it just um, the Vietnam War that you think about? My um, my voiceover is, is the tone of it. it um, not not only the tone of it, but the um, but the content of it isn't meant to. Uh, stir any kind of reaction from um, from my audience as far as the, the, the politics or how I feel about the war. Like uh, it's not it's not designed for people to um, to say, well, this person's clearly a you know left wing or this clear this guy's clearly this from a rock, you know patriotic guy or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know this flag waver or chest thumper or whatever. So it's clearly that that that's the attempt now. If you if you believe what's what's written, what was written in the 1960s by um, you know Camoli Narboni this, this um, in the Kaye du Cinema during the French New Wave, if you believe that all films are political, um, then yeah, then, then the simple act of making the film is a political act, and um, you can you can take take from it what you will as far as what you believe the you know, that will to be. But there's a reason that. Um, the, the power of, of, of the film, whether you use narr- narration or not, and the, and the power to um, you know tell tell a story is, is, is a lot of the editing. The, the writing of the documentary takes place very much in the editing, where you're cobbling together. I mean, that, that initial conversation with my father took five and a half hours. So when you're cobbling together all of this footage and trying to decide what to what to what to put in and what to leave out, um, that th- those are choices, and those active choices are political acts in a way um and so but my choice to include um my father's uh opinion about the war uh and not include my own is a you know was, was an active choice my, my decision to include um you know uh, uh glenn rickard's widow um margie belfort's uh, opinion of of glenn's feelings about the war um mean you know namely that he that he was he thought he believed that they were there to liberate and oppress people. Um, that that's a, that's a political decision or an active decision that yeah. carries with some kind of political angle. My own my own politics uh, about it, you know, is about Vietnam in general. Um, is that you know, it was sort of like as John Kerry said when he came home in, in front of Congress when he formed the Vietnam Veterans Against the War, or when he went a spokesperson for Vietnam Veterans Against the War. You have to look that up fact check that but um you know he, he said you don't want to be the, la- the the last person to die for a mistake um you know i, I don't I, I i think that by the my, my father explained pretty well too it, you know by the time my father went into vietnam there weren't that many people who were willing to defend um you know the, the america's involvement in southeast asia at that point that conflict um it's difficult now looking back you know, and sorry for this is a roundabout kind of answer to your question. No, this it's is difficult. Back for, for me, it's really hard to look at that as a war that we lost. Um, you or I could go travel to Vietnam right now. Um, we could engage in free trade. We could, we could go buy a coffee and lunch and stay at a hotel and tour the, this beautiful country. Um, and and my father could go too and be treated respectfully. Um, and almost across the board, what I've read about people going back there, the, even veterans, the guys my dad's age, is that they're 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 treated respectfully, almost almost more respectfully than than uh, than other people. Um, you know, there's somebody that's not a veteran, and that and, and and yet we have this this war that we supposedly won in Korea, which which created North Korea, which is probably the most, if not the most, one of the three or four most anti-American regimes in, in, in the world right now. And that's a war that we supposedly won. 
Um, and this isn't, I'm, I'm not alone in this opinion. This, this, this idea that like splitting Vietnam up into North and South, you know, as, as was these sort of goals were the end of the war, which you know, this Korean model, uh, that looking, this idea that, that that would have been a good idea, you know, that that would have been a good situation seems, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm trying not to, I'm trying to temper my words here, um, seems mm. like folly. It doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I see. Um, so, with the film itself, then, uh, would you do you have like a what would you say that you you intended or what is the message behind the film that you think that your audience is going to come away with? Um, you know, there there aren't many um, movies about uh, the war that war um, and their effect directly on the family and the community. Um, a lot of the wars are are bigger picture. Um, or so they're about combat, you know, kind of very over-the-top stories about addiction or suicide or, um, you know, drug abuse, you know, whatever it is. So um, uh, there, there are movies that influenced my film that, that I think, you know, in some ways that they aim to provide some kind of um, catharsis uh, for, the, for their participants and, and hopefully, um, by extension, you know, members of the audience who haven't approached this subject now. Um, there are a lot of people out there that watch this movie um, who are veterans that won't then, you know, broach the subject with their friends and family um, or, or think that it's a worthwhile thing to do. And that's totally fine. It's not, the movie's not designed to advocate for, um, you know, people to come out of their shells or go to therapy or anything like that. There's no, there's no, you know, message at the end of the movie saying, hey, you know, here's what you should do. Uh, but I don't think that, I, I think that it might be the right time now that these these people are turning, these veterans, Vietnam veterans, are turning 70, um, and and they're, you know, they're they're going to pass away of natural causes. They're going to pass away of any number of things, and um, they, they will hear they're going to take these stories to their graves. I mean, the, the, a couple of years ago, in 2011, I think the last World War One veteran died um, in, in 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 UK somewhere, uh, and, and that was a wake up call for me too. I, you know, thinking about the last Vietnam veteran dying. I mean, the, the last Vietnam veteran might actually outlive me. I mean, you know, this person might live to be 120 years old, for all I know. But the, the idea that these people are going to take their stories and their baggage to their graves and, and not share it or unload it um, is, is, is frightening or, or not, not something that, um, that, that I think is a, is a good situation. So, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully this will encourage people to have the discussions. Um, you know, I was standing with John Wilson and his wife in their kitchen. This is not the film. But, but um, you know, Barbara, uh, you know, said that she had never talked to him at any great length about this. Like I just had, having met him that day, stepped off a plane and took a, you know, went, went to a hotel, woke up the next day and met this person I had never met before and asked him all these intimate questions mm-hmm. that his, even his, his spouse hadn't even asked him. And she said she had always wanted to ask him if, if he had killed anybody. And, and she was like, she's looking at me and he's standing right there. I mean, the, the disconnect between... Um, and these are two happily married people. Uh, you know, the disconnect between um, what people want to, to do in terms of interacting with their family members and what they actually do. Right. I, I remember there was, uh, yeah. a, oh, there was a point in your movie where you had, uh, where your mother had mentioned that there was a Christmas dinner and your father was never mentioned in the Christmas dinner. And uh, there are just some conversations that never get had. No, you're absolutely right. I, mean, I think that he, um, I think that in my, in my parents will be the first person people to tell you that that's not uncommon. You know, my, my mother wasn't saying that to, to complain or to say, woe is us, or, you know, look how terrible my life was. It was more just to, just to point out that it would be unthinkable if if, if her son um, or, her, or, you know, if her son was in, you know, Iraq or Afghanistan or something and nobody mentioned him um, during a holiday dinner, you know, to say, how are you feeling? Or what's it like? Or, you know, let's drink to him or something like that. Or I wish he was here. It would be unthinkable to not mention that person. So, um, and, and, and nowadays, if you'd have him on Skype or he'd, he'd call you or something, but you know, it, it's an inter- it's an interesting time between World War II and Korea and, and Vietnam. And now, I mean, the Vietnam marks a sort of interesting um, point in, in history. I think. And with the uh, and with the actual interviews that you were able to conduct with your father, do you think that as your as his son, you were able to receive the message? As clearly as if someone else was interviewing him. Yeah, I, I get you. So what you're asking is like, did, did he? Do you think he was held, holding anything back? And the answer is no. 
I, th- I think he, I think he, I don't think that there's any information that uh, that he has, um, you know, in the back of his head that he would never say. That, but that being said, I, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, he, he, um, he certainly. Uh, there, I'm sure there are things that he saw and and feelings that he felt that he um, that he probably doesn't like to revisit or like to um, you know recount. Uh, but if I ask right, questions, right. it's up to me to ask the right questions. So I, I certainly wouldn't say that he kept anything from me. I think that he was a you know he was a, he was a, an expert witness as far as his own his own memories and things like that. Um, you know, and like I said, he's very very available for conversation. He's not somebody that is closed off in that way at all, and he's willing to talk about it as people ask. I think that that's but that's what my mom said at the very end of the movie. So you know, people people want to feel the curiosity. They want you to ask them, and and they, if you really want to know, they'll tell you. But you have to ask. You have to spend the time, and you have to you have to value that uh, that experience. Were you able to open a can of worms and maybe like open conversation for uh, for after post? post uh, documentary i think that we um i mean i just had dinner with him last night or two nights ago we had a you know a, a screening at the um at a uh, at a local um uh, place here called the pets loft um and there's a uh, this big art, art exhibit going on called support and defend and we were part of a, a panel discussion with an iraq veteran and an afghan an afghanistan war veteran um you know in his discussion and you know he he had a lot to say. I mean, the, the audience had questions for him, and the, and the moderator had a lot of questions for him, and the other panelists had questions for him. Um, and he had a lot to say. I think. I think. I don't know if it's a can of worms, though. I mean, I, I think that if I had asked him ten years before, he would have talked about it too. I don't. I don't think it was a question of him being ready. I think it was a question of me being ready. Oh, I, see. I, I don't think. I don't think that it's the veteran. Um, you know, the, you know, being a veteran being ready to talk. Um, at age 60 or age 65 or age 70, I think it's ready. It's when their family, when their sons and daughters, when their spouses, when their brothers and sisters, and uncles, their parents are ready to talk to them about it. They, 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 when that's when they can talk about it. So what's, I, think, I think they'll talk if you ask them. What's the next step then? I, after you finish this documentary, um, it, you're now ready to talk. You've you've had uh, several years to process this and um, to put this together. Is there another move? And what's the next move for the movie? What are you planning on doing with well, it? Well, well, um, r- right now I'm I'm working on a um, on a very short uh, tribute uh, video tribute to Jam C. Scrubs, um, who uh, was the founder uh, or is the founder and president emeritus of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund. Uh, and my wife and I are attending a uh, a gala uh, celebrating his retirement um, in uh, on Memorial Day in Washington D.C. So I'm I'm working on that right now, and that. You know, that opportunity came as a direct result of the, the, the film and, um, you know, the, the, the fund of seeing the film and, and, and respecting its vision. And, and Jan actually had seen it um, early on and, and, and offered me a, uh, a blurb, a quote, and, uh, you know, some, some words, some very kind words of support early on. So in the process, so, you know, I, I, I've admired him, um, you know, ever since I've, I heard of him. I mean, he, he had, um, you know, essentially began the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund and, and was instrumental in, in getting the wall built and everything else. So, um, you know, to be part of that is, is pretty amazing. And, and to be, um, you know, and you know, to be able to be in the same room with him and, and actually uh, do some work to honor him is, is incredible. But um, as far as the, the film is concerned, I mean, it, it's coming out on May 24th. Uh, it's going to be um, cable on demand and iTunes. Um, and, and it's already available for pre-order on Voodoo. And um, I'm planning on uh, donating a, a portion of the proceeds, any proceeds that we, that we actually get. Uh, to the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund as they try to um, build an education center down um, at the wall, down, down on the mall in, in D.C. So, um, you know, that that's happening. And I'm actually working, I'm editing right now a, a second uh, feature-length documentary um, about the life and music of Cuban-born um, uh, jazz pianist and composer Omar Sosa. Uh, so that's shot, um, but I'm, i got a long editing process ahead of me, so I'm sort of in the middle of that. As a director, then, while you're piecing together the, the narrative, was it hard for you to put something together that was that had taken place over 40 years ago? Well, yeah. I mean, the good thing about it is that, is that you know, my, as you as you know, because you've seen the film, the, the, my dad spent two um, the second half of his his one year tour, so about six months of it um, as as a war reporter, as a you know, for the for the um, public information office of the army. So um, he he has hundreds of. of uh, color and black and white photography, uh, you know, p- pictures from this um, from this era, 
and and I just the other thing is that I and again this this is to this is to reiterate a point I made earlier. You know, uh, Glenn Rickard Jr., uh, the son of, of Glenn Rickard, who was killed um, when his helicopter was shot down in, in May of 1970. Right. Um, his son sent me via uh, FedEx, I believe, uh, a photo album full of you know pictures of Dara and letters and you know um, let, you know all kinds of records and stuff like that. So you know. Again, my approaching these people and that their willingness to participate um, are two sides of the same coin. And they don't, my, my, my desire to make this film doesn't work without the interview subjects' um, enthusiastic participation and support of the effort. So, uh, you know, I, so to answer your question, yeah, it was difficult, but I had stuff to work with. Difficult, it's, and with. This, was, this was a dream because it was a choice between photographs. Can I slam into this? <laughs> I think and I, my dad would be first to tell you that his love is, is is not exceptional. That there are there are people like this in every town and every you know every state in this country um, who have had these experiences that are worth looking into. Whether it's the Vietnam War, whether it's you know whatever whatever it is, people's lives are extraordinary. And the and again the older the, the older these people get. Um, the closer they are to, to the end of their lives, um, the closer we are to losing um, records of, of, of their stories. And it, those, those pictures and those letters will sit in boxes and deteriorate. Um, and and it's, it, you know, it's, it's not, it doesn't have to be that way. It's, you know, again, this, this sort of act of making a film like this or whether or, or making a podcast or doing an oral history project um, is its own reward. And I think that, you know, it's, it's, it's worth sort of looking into um, you know, the lives of, 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 uh, of our family members. Do you think that there was anything that you had uh, gotten out of the film in, in the way that uh, you walked out of it with something more than you believed you were going to get? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, I, I mean, just, ha just th this conversation, I mean, I, I, I don't, I didn't think that we would, I would ever get to the point where this was a feature film, um, you know, getting national distribution, um, you know, being able to show it in, in different festivals. Um, you know, it was in uh, Johannesburg, South Africa um, in, in March. It was in, um, you know, it'll be in Wales in November. Uh, it's, you know, the fact that people are going to see it um, across North America on May 24th um, via iTunes or Voodoo or, you know, cable on demand and hopefully on DVD in a couple of months um, is, is, I'm ecstatic about. I mean, it's, it, it exceeds my, uh, my wildest accusations. Um, and, I, and again, I, I wasn't making a film as such at the beginning. It was more like, okay, let's take this and see where it goes. So now to be sitting here ten years later, um, you know, with, with, a, with a you know a film that can kind of stand on its own and, and people can um, take things away from it and, and you know do what they do with the information, um, you know, yeah, it's incredibly rewarding and, and gratifying. That's great. I, I really appreciate the conversation and, and Thanks, man. Uh, all the answers. That really is enlightening. Um, so I will try to get, I'll try to make sure that everything is uploaded and and uh, we'll have an interview up for on Hollywood and in, uh, in our uh, our uh, what is it called our website. But we will great. have that in Hollywood North in the, within the next week. But great. it was great to talk to you. You too, man. I appreciate your time. Yeah, and I actually just had one more question. How's your how's sure. your how are your parents now? They're great. I'm actually sitting in their driveway right now. My my wife and I are driving down to New York and we're dropping off our. Um, our four-year-old son, um, so we can go down and have a weekend in New York. So, uh, yeah, they're, they're both doing great. That's great. Okay, cool. That's good. Okay, well, I hope you have a great weekend then. All right, man. Take care. You too. Bye.